Frontier Elite 2, an enormous procedurally generated universe with Newtonian physics and interplanetary flight. Yeah, I think it's fair to say that this had an impact on the likes of No Man's Sky and the Outer Wilds. The original Elite should be here, but it appeared on the BBC Micro. Unlike its predecessor though, Frontier was released on DOS instead, allowing far more depth and size to the galaxy and its systems, with the ability to land on planets and being able to discover multiple planets per system. The best thing about them? They were the actual size of the real planets in our galaxy. Never before had space truly been so huge. The enhanced physics allowed for gravitational manoeuvres around these vast stellar bodies and multiple ships to plough your way through the depths of space in whether it's speedy fighters or big hulking cruisers, and much like the first game, it was a galactic sandbox that let you do as you pleased. Whether that was lawful or nefarious, helpful or hurtful, you decided who you wanted to be. And the most important part about it? It was programmed in PC assembly by interdimensional coding space lord Chris Sawyer, who I am slightly fond of. Falcon. You know those games where you're actually flying the plane like it's a simulation rather than simple pew 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 action arcade? Yeah, Falcon has so much to do with that. While it's not the first game to attempt flight simulation, Falcon was the series that treated the player like an actual pilot. And in response to this, actual pilots played Falcon and concluded, yeah, that's pretty accurate. Consequently, players would have to familiarise themselves with manuals that were hundreds of pages in size and abandon all the happy little compromises that other flight sims made to prevent them from becoming a creator of twisted metal. Enthusiasts took to this new style of simulation gleefully, joysticks firmly gripped, and ever since, there have been increasingly realistic iterations of flight simulators, all courtesy of the vision of Gilman Louie and his love of the F-16 Fighting Falcon. Indianapolis 500 What Falcon was to aircraft, Indianapolis 500 was to racing cars, with the ability to tweak and modify all kinds of things under the hood, changing motorsports on PC forever. You knew you were in for a different type of game when there was a literal subtitle saying THE SIMULATION. This was no smash and dash arcade racer. As far as the game was concerned, you were an actual IndyCar driver, in a real IndyCar. These were actual circuits, and it was going to demonstrate that with all the technological innovation 1989 could provide. The Papyrus Design Group knew that if they could get as close to reality with the driving simulation as possible, the gameplay and fun of the title would take care of itself, because it turns out that people like driving cars for fun at high speeds. Who knew? Wing Commander 3 you know those story-heavy games with extensive cutscenes and three movies worth of voice acting in them? The ones you're either massively involved in or desperately trying to skip to get to the gameplay? You can thank FMV-heavy Wing Commander 3 for popularising that. While most FMV games were leaning heavily on the novelty and sacrificing huge chunks of gameplay to do so, Chris Roberts decided to go a different direction. Having a solid flight engine for the space combat with interesting missions that carried the story forward, and then interspersing it with an interstellar conflict caught on video courtesy of the new CD-ROM multimedia technology that the market had recently been blessed with. He'd already experimented with in-engine cutscenes in his previous Wing Commander games, but it was the third title in the series that really allowed him to bring his directorial chops to the Galactic Wars. With Hollywood actors like Malcolm McDowell, John Rhys Davis, Tim Curry, and of course Star Wars actor Mark Hamill as Christopher Blair. While the visual feast that was FMV faded into obscurity with time, the lengthy cutscenes featuring big name actors in pricey gaming blockbusters remained. And whether you think that's a good or a bad thing, Wing Commander 3 was undoubtedly responsible for popularising it. Descent. While influential in helping make the 6DOF control scheme a thing, it was the graphics that really set Descent apart. It's fully 3D, in a way that Ultima Underworld isn't, because the enemies are also fully 3D. It's true 3D and it did it before Quake appeared. So while id's shooter is an order of magnitude larger in terms of actual influence on the gaming scene, Descent was a pioneer in two areas, one of which is becoming more important as time passes. 
You see, 6DOF has come back into prominence in a big way, thanks to its adoption by the virtual reality market. The immersive approach that Descent took to movement has been applied to the exploration of virtual spaces, meaning that with each passing year, Descent becomes more influential. Fade to black. Here's an idea, said Delphine Software. Let's stick the camera behind a motion-captured character and have it zoom in to aim, all in a 3D environment. Yep, this is a third-person shooter for DOS, but it came out in 1995, before Tomb Raider, before MDK, before the genre was even a thing. The sci-fi sequel to platformer flashback, you've returned into the boots of Conrad Hart for another adventure. But this time it's from a totally different perspective that was very new to a lot of people. Sure, by modern standards, the controls aren't anywhere near the standardization to come, and much like with Quake and Descent, you've got a case of one game dwarfing the other in terms of actual influence, thank you Lara Croft, but there's no denying your own eyes when you see Fade to Black in action, and it was something that nobody had really seen before, complete with creepy soundtrack and rendered fully voiced cutscenes. People didn't know how to take it. Fortunately, the British press at Games Master and PC Gamer understood the appeal of this new genre and included it in their best of lists to make sure that it wasn't another notable French game that didn't get its plaudits. You know, like the original Dune? You should really play that. Tetris. A perfect example of what I was talking about back in the beginning of this video. Although running on a rack-mounted Electronica 60 for the first two years of its life, the mass-marketed version of Tetris with graphics first appeared on DOS in 1986 in the Soviet Union. It's not difficult to make a case for Tetris being influential, as it casts a long shadow over every puzzle game ever made. Why is that, Lonnie? Because forget Wikipedia and their bogus statistics, Tetris is the best-selling game ever made, passing 500 million sales 10 years ago. To put that into perspective, that's more than double the sales of Minecraft. It's more than the entire Pokemon franchise combined. It's infuriating, brilliant, simple yet complex, and deserves all the accolades heaped upon it over the last four decades. I still play it on a weekly basis. And yes, I'm still terrible at it. Karina utterly destroys me, much to her amusement. It single-handedly popularized both the puzzle genre and the concept of a mobile game, and it continues to dominate that market, and will do so until the extinction of the human race. Even then, some bizarre animals may take up the mantle and start playing it, you never know. So there you are, a bunch of really influential games, and save for the final entry, and Frontier, which was coded originally for something else, but Chris Sawyer sorted that out, they all began their life on DOS. Hopefully this little list makes you understand just how important this venerable old OS is. Oh, and if you like that video, I have hundreds of scripted videos and a playlist over there. Feel free to take a look. And if you like what you see from the channel, you can always subscribe. Until next time.